It's come to that point where we need to write some code um, and demonstrate some of these topics that we've been talking about with principal components analysis and singular value decomposition using some numbers. Um, and so we're going to load up a data set in MATLAB and then play with some of these concepts that I've been telling you about and also show you that some of the things that I've asserted are actually true if we just try it out numerically. So the data set uh, that we're going to load up today is one of the built-in data sets in MATLAB. It's also um, it's actually a really popular data set. A lot of people have used it, and it's built into a lot of different um, a, a package, pa software packages for that reason. Um, so it's called the Fisher Iris data set because it's um, the data set actually was collected by this guy named Fisher, and he went out and, and, and took irises of three different species and, uh, and measured um, a couple of physical characteristics about a bunch of these flowers of different species. So that's what the data set is. It's called Fisher Iris. And if we look at what's in there, it's composed of a data matrix. Here it's called MES measurements. Um, and uh, there's also a label for each, of the, uh, for each of the rows of the matrix. So what we're going to do is our data matrix, I'm going to call x. I'm going to assign it the value of this thing that's called the measurement matrix here. And so to uh, remind ourselves of what this data matrix looks like, we have 150 flowers one on a row, and for each flower, we have four measurements. OK? And in addition, we have this species vector, which tells us the name of each of those 150 flowers. We'll come back to that a little bit later. OK? So for now, this is my x, this is my x matrix. This is my data matrix x. And it is 150 by 4. So let's just remember that, right? So. The first thing we can do is um, we can just look at some of these, uh, these measurements in x. So for example, we can plot a histogram of the first column of x, so whatever the first measurement is. And uh, we can see that here's its distribution, right? Looks reasonable. If we wanted to look at more than one measurement at the same time, we can make a scatter plot. So we can plot, for example, whatever the first measurement is by the second measurement and uh, plot those as dots. So we end up with something like this. Um, so this first measurement on the horizontal axis, second measurement on the vertical axis, and here's all 150 flowers that I have measured. And that's their distribution. Okay. That's good. If we wanted to do more than that, it gets a little bit difficult. right? We can potentially do a, uh, a three-dimensional scatter plot, putting a dot in um, measurement one space and measurement two space and measurement three space. And then what do we do with the fourth one? Well, we can make a movie, I suppose, right? But this is not temporal data, so that may not even make any sense either. And so even though this data set x is not particularly large, it is by no means big data in the way that we've been talking about it, it's sufficiently large to explain and illustrate some of the principles we've been talking about and also illustrate the usefulness of, um, of PCA and SVD without getting too complicated. Okay, so we're going to use it, and um, and I'm going to demonstrate some of the, the, the some of the concepts that I've been talking to you about in the last couple of sections. So the first thing we're going to do is compute the the PCA based on the first method that I told you about, which is uh, taking um, the eigen decomposition of x transpose times x. So I can compute x transpose times uh, not t x, right? And uh, I will take the eigen decomposition of that 4 by 4 matrix. So we can see here that, um, let's assign this C. C is a 4 by 4 matrix, has four measurements. So that makes sense, right? Next, I'm going to take the eigen decomposition of C. And I'm going to assign uh, the output of the eigen decomposition of the eig function into a, uh, something I'm going to call a w vector and a lambda, uh, w matrix and a lambda matrix, right? So this is the eigen decomposition of C, which is uh, x transpose x. Let's check the sizes of W and lambda. W is a 4 by 4, just like we think it should be. And lambda should also be a 4 by 4. And it is, just like we think it should be. And it has a diagonal. Right? So the scaling of lambda is somewhat arbitrary. What we care about is the relative value. So what we can see here is that um, because of the way that the eig function works in MATLAB, the largest eigenvalue is actually the, the last one here, which is bigger than this one, which is bigger than this one, which is bigger than this one. 
right? So in order to put this into PCA space, what we're going to have to do is reorder all of these uh, principal components because by looking at lambda, we know that this is actually the first PC, this is PC2, this is PC3, this is PC4, right? OK, so what we're going to I'm going to do is go ahead and reorder my W, right? Because right now, this one corresponds to that one. This is the smallest PC. This should be PC4. This one's a little bigger, so it's PC3. So I'm going to flip the W matrix so that we have the W matrix in order, just so that to satisfy the, the, the constraints of PCA as we've constructed it. So W, I'm going to say, is W um, all of the rows. And I'm going to flip the columns by doing the following operation. So now everything's flipped. And um, I'm going to flip lambda as well so that there's still this correspondence. Negative 1 to 1. So that flips it. OK, all good? All right. Um, and uh, I'm going to take lambda. Um, that's good. That's great. OK, so that is one way of computing the PCA. Uh, next, I'm going to compute the PCA by, by, by using the singular value decomposition, uh, which is a built-in function, so you can just call it. So remember, the singular value decomposition is SVD. So I'm going to take the SVD of x, right? No computing the covariance matrix C here, just with x. And it has three outputs, like we said before. So um, the, the SVD is u times sigma times v star equals x. So that's the order of outputs of the, of the function that we're going to call as well. We're going to get a u, we're going to get a sigma, and we're going to get a v. And that's going to be the output of my, of my SVD of x. OK? Let's check on the sizes of, uh, of v then, because v is the one that's equivalent to my, to my other computation, w. Ah, it is, uh, is 4 by 4, just like we think it should be. This is very good, right? Um, and uh, so this is v. This is w, which is the other way computed it. So here we have two ways of computing the principal components of the data set, this, four, um, this 150 by 4 data set. Right? So we know that the principal components, the PCs, should turn out to be vectors of 4. Right? This is the way we computed it by using w. Right? So w here, uh, we computed it by using eigen decomposition of x transpose x, right? And this v here came out of the SVD, right? So SVD uh, gives us x equals u sigma v. And you can see that they are identical. Now, because these are vectors and they indicate directions in space, the sign of them is actually completely arbitrary. So I'm, um, I'm seeing that, um, that the v's and w's, if you look at the numbers, the absolute values, they're the same, but they're sort of opposite signs, right? So these are all negative, and these are all positive. First two are positive, first two are negative, second two are negative, and second two are, ne are, are positive. So I'm just going to uh, get the negative of v instead, right? Because the scaling is actually arbitrary. We're talking about a direction in space. You can multiply it by, by any scalar, positive or negative, and it doesn't change anything about what w actually is, right? So if you compare that w to v, right? they are actually completely identical. So the two computations that we were talking about, either doing the covariance matrix and taking the eigen decomposition or taking the SVD of x directly, gives us the same answer. That's good. All right. So that's something I told you before, and I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> um, so next thing we're going to do is uh, try to use uh, this data that we've just computed, this, this, this v matrix here, in order to project the data onto uh, something smaller that we can really look at. So the scores of the projections are, are going to be, um, I'm going to pick r equals 2, right? Because I want to truncate the basis so that I can plot it on a flat piece of paper. So that's the reason I'm picking 2 for now, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, v sub r equals the first two columns of, of v. So I'm truncating so that I'm only taking the first two principal components into account, right? And what I'm going to do is project all of my measurements onto v sub r, right? And what I'm going to end up with is a, pro is a projected matrix A that has the same number of flowers as before, but instead of having four numbers explaining each of them, I now have two numbers explaining each of them. And I like that because now I can plot these two. And those two dimensions, these two PCs, actually incorporate all four measurements. So I'm not ignoring anything. 
I'm just aggregating the information in such a way that I can look at it on a piece of paper a little more easily. So if I wanted to plot that, I'm going to make a figure. I'm going to plot uh, each column of A as one of the as one of the axes, right? Here we go. Oh, and uh, it connected with lines, each of the dots. And so I need to make this a scatter plot um, by specifying that I only want dots, right? Here it is. Here's my plot, right? And um, I'm going to label it with X label is PC1. Oops. There we go, PC1. And the vertical axis is PC2. Here we go. And there's our plot. Okay, so I've taken data that is not necessarily huge. It's only four measurements, but even four measurements can be somewhat kind of challenging. I have projected that data onto the first two principal components, and here's all the data. I'm not ignoring anything. I'm just projecting it so that I can visualize the data. Here's all of the all all 150 flowers in this measurement set. Okay. So next, I'm going to say, ask the question, well, were these two principal components, was that the right thing to do? Like, should I have picked three? Would that have been better? Was one sufficient? This is the kind of question I would like to ask, right? And so following the discussion we had earlier, what we can do is uh, look at the value of the, singular, of the singular values, these sigmas that come out, right? And by looking at the relative value, we can assess the, we can assess how many, how many of these singular values, how many singular vectors we really need to keep in order to explain a reasonable amount of the data, right? Um, and so what we're going to do is remember that our sigma matrix was very large, and it's full of zeros. So if you look at the size of sig, it's 150 by 4, right? But uh, there's only four numbers in there that, is, that are not zero, and it's the first four diagonals. So it's in position 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, 4. So what I'm going to do is um, get those out by calling the diag of sig. And here we go. Those are the first four singular values. And those are the only values in this sig matrix that are not exactly zero. All right? So you already you can kind of see something interesting, right? The first one's bigger than the second one, a lot bigger than the second one, which is quite a bit bigger than the third one, which is approximately the same as, uh, as the fourth one. And so the plot that I'm going to plot is, uh, is by taking the cumulative sum of these singular values, like, like we talked about in the last section. And uh, the way that we're going to do that um, is by um, we're going to do the, uh, make a figure and do a stairs plot, which is a cool kind of plot. And we're going to take the cumulative sum of the singular values, so adding them up one more at a time, and dividing that by the sum of the singular values so that I get something that adds up to 1. Right? So let's see what that plot looks like. Here's my stairs plot. Right? On the horizontal axis are the singular values, so singular value 1, 2, 3, and 4, because there's only four of them. That's all I got. They, uh, they, they each get bigger, and the steps get smaller. The stairs plot, each step actually gets smaller, and that's good because they're order. Now, what we can see uh, is the first singular value we're already at explaining a lot of the data. A lot of the data explained by the first singular value because we're already at 0.8 out of 1, right? If you add the second one, we are well above 95%. Okay? So this makes me feel better about our projecting the data onto the first uh, two dimensions, because by this assessment, we can see that the data is actually very well explained by the first two principal components. We don't really need the other two. They're there. They explain some of the data. Uh, but we can get away with just using the first two. So now plotting the data into the first two principal components is no longer a matter of convenience. It's actually also justified by the mathematics, right? Because what this analysis tells us is that um, is that it, it, the, the first two singular values, the first two principal components of the data, explain a vast majority of the data. And uh, we can simplify the data and reduce its dimensionality and its complexity by simply projecting onto those particular columns of the V vector, of the V matrix or the W matrix, depending on how we computed it. Okay, so there's one more thing that's kind of cool about this data set, uh, which is uh, remember I said before that the data set actually comes with labels for each one of these flowers. And we've ignored all of those labels up until the present moment, right? So it's this uh, species vector, right? And it's just a bunch of labels of names for the three types of irises that were in the original data set. 
Okay, and it has 150 elements, one for each flower. So what we're going to do is um, see if we c visualize all 150 flowers and then gave each dot a color corresponding to the species it happens to belong to, is there anything there in PCA space, right? So let's try that. So we're going to plot a figure um, and uh, we're going to build a, um, a scatter plot of projection onto the first principal component, projection, let's be a one there, projection onto the second principal component. I want all my dots to be of size uh, 30, and I want them to be colored based on the species. Here we go. That's my plot. This is exactly the same plot as before, where before we had a, just a dot the same, of the same color for, for each of the flowers. Now, the, the axes are the same. We're still looking at PC1 and PC2. But I've also given each dot a color depending on which species of iris it belonged to. So this is a really nice feature that's popping out immediately, right? I have not used this color information in any of the analysis. It was based entirely on the X matrix. But you can see that if you project the data down to the simplified space, the simplified two-dimensional principal component space, there is clustering here where here's one type of flower, here's another type of flower, and here's an yet another type of flower that's way out here by itself. Okay, this is really nice. Didn't necessarily have to happen, but it's really nice because now what we can do is build classification and classifiers on top of this PC space, right? And that is a more tractable and explanatory task than doing it on the full, full dimensional measurement space. Again, in this case, because the data is not actually that big, it wouldn't have been that much of a challenge to build a classifier in four dimensional space, but it does illustrate some of the principles, right? Even though we projected it onto the first two principal components and we're ignoring the other two, and I've reduced the dimensionality of my data set by half, it turns out I've actually explained more than 95% of the data, right? And in that data, if I plotted all of my dots by the color of the underlying categor categorical information that was given to me separately, there's actually structure there. There actually are systematic differences between these three types of flowers that, uh, that are really visually obvious, even in the first two principal components. And so that's a topic we're going to come back to uh, in the next couple of um, lectures and also weeks, this idea of, of um, defining features and finding patterns in the data. Right? So PC1 and PC2 are what I'm calling patterns. These are patterns in the data. And if we can pick out these features, repeated patterns in the data, then there's more analysis that we can do on top. And, and it enables a lot of analyses that would not be possible in the full dimensional measurement space when it becomes very large.